Thank you. So, how is everybody doing? Good? Good? Want to have some fun now? Yeah. After all of the microbe stuff? Okay. <laughs> so, my goal today is, is to talk to you about how to scale ideas. Now, before we begin, there are two important elements that I want to clarify. One, what is the meaning of the word scale? Scale to me means moving anything from one level to the next. So, as an example, how do you move an idea from an individual to a team? And how do you move an idea from a team to an organization? The other word is, what is innovation, right? Innovation means many different things to many people, but to me, and in this presentation, I am going to look at how do you work with your ideas within organizations. So, I know it's, it's almost time to end, so we are going to begin by going through an exercise. So I want everybody to stand because it's a long day. Right? We need to get our juices flowing. Right? All right. So now, I was originally going to do this, you know, having you sit, but I think you may go to sleep. So we're going to do it standing up. So number one, I want you to close your eyes and think about the last time you had an idea before you entered this auditorium today because I know you have got a lot of ideas today. But the last time you had an idea, now I want you to think about where did you get it. And I also want you to think about what did you do with it? Did you write it down? Did you talk about it? Did you play with it? Right? So I want you to bring yourselves back to that place when you had your last idea. Now, have a seat. And if you are like most people, including myself, Ideas come in our brains, and most of the time, we throw them out. We never, ever give ideas their due diligence, right? And this happens at organizations. This even happens at larger scales. We are built to generate new ideas, and we do it on a regular basis. However, once we generate them, we really don't do much with them, right? So let me take you on a journey. And I'm going to go to this. So I began examining this problem about why do organizations struggle with ideas. And depending on who you ask, they will tell you that I began that either at Washington or before. So the image on the left was my office up in Seattle when I was an assistant professor. It's a very traditional office, right? And the image next to it is the library. So I spend lots of time asking the question, why are we bad at managing ideas? Okay? And just like any regular academic, I went and I looked up books. So if you do a screenshot on Google Images for books, this is just not even a quarter of the page. So, we have generated so much knowledge. Every year there are no new books on innovation. I am guilty of writing one of those myself. <laughs> right? And we keep generating books and books and books. We've been writing about innovation since the 20s, 1920s. But why are we so bad? Do we not read these books? No, we read these books, right? So then I thought to myself, okay, well, academics, they write very strangely, right? We write in these very verbose ways, and plus business individuals are very busy. So I thought, okay, let me look at something else. So if you look up innovation frameworks, you have a bunch of them. So people have taken ideas in books and distilled them down to flowcharts and two-by-two two matrices. And I'm sure you've seen some of these. So we, we have the Twitter version of books, which is this. Right? This is a Twitter version of books. You can easily represent this in a tweet. So then I asked myself, okay, why are companies, why are organizations not using that? And so I was struggling, and I was getting very depressed, right? 
because I had a professors who were reviewing me for promotion and tenure and all these things, and, and I keep banging my head, keep banging my head. And then I decide to do something very strange. I decide that the answer is not here. The answer doesn't lie here. Actually, this may be part of the problem. The answer to me began when I started doing things like this. That's an actual plaque that hangs in a pub in Seattle. That's my only claim to fame. I will never get a Nobel Prize or anything, <laughs> but I have a plaque that hangs in Seattle. And that's an image of one of the first meetings, it is not the first meeting, of a group of students in my class. And I began having these meetings at various places with entrepreneurs, designers, athletes, artists, and I wanted to get at when were they successful at leveraging their ideas, scaling them, and find what worked from the ground up. So I did not want to do surveys. I did not want to do traditional case studies. I wanted to actually embed myself in many different environments to figure out what happens. So today what I'm going to give you right, is a half answer to this question. Okay? So I'm going to give you five, because I know if I give you more than five, it's going to go whoosh. So we're going to keep five. I'm going to make it very, very easy. But before I tell you the answers, there's a very important word there, tentative solutions. Why are they tentative? Because these need to go through constant revision. These need to go through constant evolution. There's never the right, perfect answer, okay? We strive for perfection way too often, right? So I'm telling you these are incomplete answers. The other reason why these are tentative is they need to be adapted into the context in which you deploy them. So you will have to revise them, okay? But every solution that I give you meets two criteria, two very important criteria. One, they are frugal. By frugal, I don't mean cheap, right? When we use the word frugal, we often say cheap. No, I don't mean cheap. Take your fridge in your house as an example, right? Your fridge probably has close to 3,000 components in it. But to actually keep food cold, you only need 200 components. We don't need like one drawer for vegetables and freezer drawers and this drawer and that drawer. To just get a fridge to work, you need 200 components, yet we build these things. When we go and get applications, right? Like, like most of us use probably 8 to 10% of Excel, but yet we have all the features in the world, right? So I'm going to give you things that you don't need a big budget to actually try out, okay? The other uh, criteria of these solutions that I give you is you can try it at any scale. You can try this as an individual, or if you run a team, your team can try this. Or if you run a large organization, try it at the organizational level. So these solutions don't, it, don't vary with scale that much. Okay, so let's begin. So five key points. One, Build, manage, run playful environments in your organizations. Your organization should play more than they work. Now, you can blame your mom and dad. I'll blame my mom and dad, and I hope my mom and dad's watching. But, right? When we we're kids, play was okay within reason, but then we were told, go back and work. So from very early on, we are programmed that work is the opposite of play. But a very l noted scholar from New Zealand, Brian Smith, said very aptly, he said, the opposite of play is not work, it is actually depression. Think about that for a minute. The opposite of play is not work, it's actually depression. That's significant. In organizations, 
in 90% of the organizations. I know there are exceptions. When people play, they play during things like office retreats. They go off, off their office premises to play. When they're at work, they're like routine mechanics, doing stuff. The problem with that is, with the coming age of automation and AI, most of those tasks are going away. We need to bring back play in organizations. We need to bring back a level of play because when you play, you are mindful. When you play, you are creative. You never play the same game in the same way twice. You have to think about it. You have to think through strategy and you have to think of new ways to break rules. Play is very important. So number one, find ways to play more in your organizations. Okay. Number two, advocacy. Now, how many of you have an idea advocate? I see one hand or maybe two. Maybe it's late, right? So what is an idea advocate? How many of you have one? I have a few. So here's another concept. As organizations grow, because of the evolutionary nature of them being, they build processes to screen stuff by default. We screen things as, as information moves up the chain. We screen things as things move laterally. And as a result, most people don't have a voice for their ideas. Okay? What I have done in several organizations, and I've even asked small teams to try this, is try every week okay, to do two things. One, become an idea advocate. What does that mean? Get into the art of listening to other people's ideas. We have a hard time listening to other people's ideas. Take the time to do that. And number two, communicate your own ideas to other people, especially the minute it comes in your head. Call a friend. Tweet about it. Don't kill it. If we start to have conversations around ideas and we start building a capacity to advocate for ideas, we will become amplifiers of new ideas. We will not just reject and screen out ideas or not even pay attention. Right? So number two, become an idea advocate and find one. Right? Do not kill an idea before you talk to somebody about it. The world needs more ideas. Talk to people about it. Number three, frugal experimentation. Think back to when you were kids, right? I still do this, so. Before you wanted to learn something, did you go and read a book and you come up with some theory and you do all this stuff? No. Let me press and see what happens. If I don't get burnt, I keep pressing. <laughs> Let me see how much I can scream, and if I get my way, guess what? I'm going to scream more. We learn by doing. We learn through experimentation. As humans, that is one of our innate abilities, is the ability to experiment. But as we grow older, we think of experimentation as this thing that individuals in labs have to do. We think of experimentation as, oh, I need to come up with a theory, and I need to have these hypotheses, and I need to do it. No. Think about experimentation in a very basic way. You have an idea. Quickly think about what interventions can you try to figure out whether that idea actually has legs. Then go collect some data. And you don't need to go to a fancy math classes or anything. There are online tools to help you analyze your data. Do not get into the business of discarding ideas without experimentation. There's a very old journal article by a professor named Langley. And she looked at the two extremes. One, you have people that fall into the trap of paralysis through analysis. They keep mining, oh, well, maybe I need more data, maybe I need... Now, the other extreme, you have people who fall into another trap. It's called extinction by intuition. Experimentation gives you that happy middle. It allows you to balance the two extremes, and if you build a skill to experiment, you have a greater chance of increasing 
your throughput with ideas. Two more, network visibility. Very simple here. Yeah. In, in the age where we are all connected, right? We are all on different social networks and all these other things. I would hypothesize to say we are network poor. We might be connected a lot, but you probably don't know what that means. You probably have more connections, but you don't know how to leverage them. And the reason being, we assume that just because we are connected means we have a network. And just because a person likes something, it was cool, right? But in, in today's age, my request to you is the following. Go back to the old school. Figure out how you can, how you can connect human to human. There are already, as you heard in the previous presentation, machine to machine connections happening. In the future, my robot is going to like a thing that your robot has online. That's not what makes us human. We need to go back to connecting. So lastly, emergent platforms. This is where I encourage all of you to think about how would you design platforms that are low cost, that bring in people to collaborate together, to co-create and have conversations. Collaborate, co-create and have conversations. Today we have more platforms to leverage what individuals have called the collective intelligence. We don't need to solve problems on our own anymore, but we need to create many more platforms where we can leverage collective intelligence, where we can crowdsource expertise, ideas, networks. So build your own version of this thing that you're in, TED. You don't need to have just one event a year. Have events in your office after hours. Bring in guest speakers. Go to other events. Conference rooms are very cheap late at night. Nobody uses them. Coffee's cheap. Build your own emergent platforms. So with that, I'm going to wrap up, and I'm going to leave you with this. I believe we can scale innovation, and we have the capacity do, to do it, but it takes all of you. And the words that I want you to take back, Number one, play. Play a lot. Two, advocate. Find one and become one. Three, experiment, experiment, experiment. Four, network. And I mean real network, not machine-to-machine -machine networking. And then lastly, design your own emergent platforms. And with that, thank you.